ask for a little what they want to talk about. Yeah, so we're going to do it a little bit different today. We want to know more about what kind of questions you guys have first so we can answer those. So, uh, Elizabeth, you want to write them on the board? What kind of yeah. questions would you have that you want me to cover today? Where are you feeling pain in your business? Where are you struggling? Where do you want to grow? Uh, anyone? What's your schedule look like every day? Okay. Where are you finding talent? Referral business? talk about the Nick that nobody knows about. The Nick before real estate. What did you do before real estate? Uh, before real estate, so I was in college delivering pizzas, one of the best jobs in the world because it's no stress um, and the easiest job, right? So, you know, you get stiffed on a couple tips and you start looking for other opportunities and there was a job posting for real estate assistance. And to even back that story up a little bit further is my brother and I, who's now my business partner, Austin, um, we were interested in buying or owning a business or flipping houses. You know, he read the Rich Dad, Poor Dad book. And at 14, 13, 14, or 15, he was trying to contract for houses that we couldn't afford or they weren't even good deals. So this assistant job was paying 12 bucks an hour or something like that. And uh, right, I went to the University of Texas at Dallas, so it was right up the road and got the job. Uh, for, the, for the first year, it was working for them hourly, and they, were, they implemented a showing assistant model before anybody was really talking about showing assistants. So what, were your, what did you do as their assistant? I was a horrible assistant. Um, I didn't say how you did, I said what you did. Uh, <laughs> that was that was I didn't do a lot, yeah. they should have fired me. Um, <laughs> So my job was to come in every day and to, to send out their postcards. Uh, I had an accordion file I would send out, you know, I think it was three or four different postcards you know, every day to expires for sale by owners and to the farm they were hitting. They were, at the time, the number one Richardson broker, if I remember correctly, um, when I joined them. And they were really good at referral business and they were really good at getting in and owning uh, the neighborhood that they lived in. So I got to learn from them uh, you know, postcard marketing, um, the customer service side of things, um, and, and at times how crazy, you know, clients can be. And what year was that? 2005 to 2006. Okay, so then how did you transition out of that role? 
So I, I got licensed uh, in 2006. I graduated from college in 2007. I was on the, the seven or eight year college plan. And um, at that time, they offered me, uh, I think it was like 30 to $32,000 a year salary. And I think they were making over half a million dollars in, in commissions. And so I said, if I went full time as a licensed agent, can I make six, six figures my first year? And like most real estate brokerages, they said yes. So that was in 2007, I sold three houses. So I didn't make six figures. Uh, Were you full time? I was full time, yeah, I was full time. So how did you survive? Just Or what did that equate to? In, in volume, that was probably, I'd have to go and look it up. I, I'm not prepared for that one. But um, that was probably, Probably like twenty thousand, twenty five thousand dollars. Okay. If that. Yeah. So just shy of a hundred thousand. Just shy. Just shy. <laughs> Fell a little short of my goal. Yeah. Yeah. So what then, knowing that you fell short by your goal by seventy five percent, what kept you going? Uh, the the I didn't want to be a failure. So you know you start hitting up all your friends and telling them what you're doing, and you know they're at twenty. I was twenty four at the time. I just bought a house as well. I graduated college, bought a house, bought a truck that was 525 bucks a month that I couldn't afford. So, you know, you don't want to want have to give back a car. You don't want to like you know sell because you can't afford it. And you want you're telling your your friends to tell their parents, hey, I can sell their house or help them buy a house. And a little bit back to where I was, I kind of pitched a lot of MLM type deals, multi-level marketing. And so they just thought this was just another crazy job or career that I was going into. Trying to get rich quick. Get rich, yeah, get rich quick. <laughs> yeah, so um, it, learning from YouTube, YouTube was my coach at the time because it was free. Um, the script, you know, scripting and dialogue practice. Um, I did join Keller Williams in 2007. I don't want to make this a Keller Williams pitch, but what they were training versus what I was getting at an independent brokerage was completely different, right? You know, they, they were talking, the recession was, was coming into full force in 2008, and a lot of referral-based business agents were, were struggling. So if you read the Millionaire Real Estate Agent book, they talked about a prospecting-based business. So a prospecting-based business is one that you're gonna go out and, and talk to people, you're gonna call, cold call people, you're gonna door knock. You know, even, I even kinda count open houses as a prospecting-based business. Sure. So it was it was teaching myself how to prospect. Okay, and how'd that go that first year? So prospecting or so second year. Two thousand eight, I sold fifteen houses. <clears throat> Not a hundred thousand dollars, just shy. Closer, just shy. Closer. But I'm almost there. I'm almost there. Um, and, and out of those, it was ten buyers and five sellers that I represented. So those those buyers came from. A lot of Craigslist marketing. So at the time, Craigslist was re was really good. There was uh, I bought an ad, I bought a, a a lead generation kit on eBay for like 25, 30 bucks, um, and it was po basically it was a it was a single word page document telling you how to just go and paste these ads on Craigslist. So um, I started posting them. I didn't even have an IDX. My website, I couldn't even afford a, a real. Uh, a home search website and so I had people signing up that they couldn't even search houses for sale on my website even though that's what I was pitching them at the time so it was more just getting them in calling them talking to them and fall and learning the follow-up processes and, and implementing a schedule so you know talking about schedule yeah what schedule did you implement on yourself that year then let's talk about you as a new agent prospecting so for like most agents we probably got in this business for time freedom right you know, it, it, looks, it sounds cool, right, Tessa? Yeah. Like we get into this because we don't want to. I'm still looking for it. Yeah, you know, <laughs> freedom of time. Um, so that in 2008, it was really getting regiment on being purposeful on my calling and reaching out to people. I didn't. I really didn't want to be a referral-based agent, right? You know, in 2008, the recession was hitting, and we saw these referral-based agents struggling to make their house notes, struggling to make their car payments, struggling to make ends meet because. They forgot how to go out and, and prospect for new business. So it was 
wanting to make a recession-proof business, and then ultimately, hopefully later on, bringing in referrals if we if we did it if I did a great job. So, with those 15 homes, 10 were buyers, five were sellers. We know Craigslist is a source. What's the other one or two other main sources for those leads, those prospects, those closings? So, um, there was two of them that were referrals, um, and the the other 13 were cold business. So it was Craigslist and a combination of there was a there was this. You could buy Google traffic called home buyer. It was a home buyer game link or something like that. So you could buy traffic to a website. So it was one of the first kind of landing pages or, or what everyone's talking about now, funnels. It was one of the first funnels out there that I knew about. So I was buying some pay-per-click traffic to a website and would, was working on trying to convert that one. Okay, and so at this point, we're still single agent, no one else, no partnership, no, no team. Partnership. Needs, no partnership, wasn't even thinking about a team. Yeah, I was trying to make hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> so you talk about you wanted to go and get your business by prospect. You didn't want to sit and wait for business to come in from referrals. So a lot of times the, the biggest problem we have is even just picking up the phone, right? Just getting past that mental stigma. But let's say somebody's already there and they have no problem making the dials. What advice would you give to them if their business is going to be based off of making the phone calls? Do they want to make money, right? So, so. In 2008, I had eight contracts fall out in one month. I went 0 for 8. It's never happened again, nor do I want it to happen again, right? That's, you're riding high. Let's just say you have three, four, five deals under contract in one month. You're like, man, that's, that's a great, that's a killer month. I had eight deals. I was already planning on figuring how to spend that money. And then they all fell apart. Stock market went to, went to crap. Uh, people were just, they were scared. The sky was falling. And I had no money. So I started looking for jobs and interviewing for jobs, and I was gonna take anything, but I, w I wanted to try to stay in real estate, so I was interviewing at the time, foreclosures were really big, so I was interviewing at asset management companies. You know, Those were the ones that were handling the foreclosures for banks. So I interviewed at this company right up the road and got you know got a job offer, and I think they were paying 55 or $60,000, which was more than I was making, but their minimum requirement was six days a week to work, minimum. They really wanted you to work Monday through Sunday. And in order to, you're not gonna hit 100 even with their bonus plan. Um, they made it so far out of reach that you know, there's no way it was gonna work. And so what I realized, you know, that that light bulb went off was, if we look at a prospecting based business, it's the same thing as going out there and looking for a job, right? You have to go out and put feelers out there. You've gotta go and sell yourself at a job interview. You probably have to follow up with that hiring manager. And then you still have to get the job and do the work. And now you have to be there Monday through Friday or Monday through Saturday with this job minimum from eight to five, eight to six or whatever, and you have a capped earning potential. And when you first get first start looking for the job, it's still typically two to three weeks pre your first paycheck, which is like selling yeah. out. And then when you're looking for jobs, you're going on like a Craigslist. And I'm like, all right, I can post I can post lead I can post ads on Craigslist to try to get leads in. So it was a matter of treating this more like a drug. You wanna wake up every morning and, and have to fight traffic, go into work, and, and be at a job that you don't like. Um, you know, if you're like me, I don't wanna be there. I wouldn't wanna do it. So I just applied a job mentality to this at first. So it was from waking up to, to the end of night, um, it was placing ads and it was calling and following up with people. To, you know, and, and your money's in the follow-up. Right, so you're not going to close someone typically on the on the first phone call. So you're going to have to start building that rapport. Okay, so now you've got this new mindset. You were looking for a job, kind of talked yourself back into the real estate business. What what is your next step? So next step is you know again next step is try to make a hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> so that's you know if you if you notice how my goals are you know at first it's always money related. Uh, my goals now is uh, I want to have private jet money. So I'm putting yeah that's that's my goals now. Uh, but it's in 2009, you know, if we fast forward, I did 15, 15 uh, total transactions in 2008, 2009, I did 23. So, you know, if you start putting in the work, you start seeing that increase, right? You have lagging and leading indicators. And your lagging, your leading indicators are the calls you make and the follow-ups that you're doing. And even the, the, the outbound, you know, marketing that you're doing, whether it's Craigslist ad, whether you're you're strategically posting on social media, that can be a leading indicator 
of what you're doing. Your lagging indicators are gonna be the, your appointments because you can't control them. You know, the number of people that sign and list or buy with you. Your commissions are lagging indicators. So if we really look at it, all the work that I'm doing in 2008, all the study and everything that I'm implementing is starting to pay off. Um, in 2009, only I did six sellers and 17 buyers. Only one of those sellers was an expired. So the rest of them were coming through uh, a Craigslist or paid lead generation or some type of referral at that time. And then, were you still solo in 2009? 2009, I was still solo until roughly the end, roughly the last half of the 2009 is when, when I brought my brother into the business. So my brother was running a, a oil and gas call room. So, you know, think of if you've seen the movie Boiler Room, that's basically what they were doing. They were, they were calling high net worth individuals um, over the phone and, and basically soliciting them to send them a $100,000 or more check to hopefully drill and strike oil or gas and to get, you know, royalty payments. So we were talking, I was, I was seeing how much money that they were making and even my brother at the time, he was over six figures um, at the oil and gas company. And I'm like, if we can incorporate a, a cold call or a calling type center, no one else was truly doing that that, that I knew of. I'm like, we could, we, could, we could kill it if we incorporated that. So, you know, we started forming that partnership and in 2009, total commissions was $120,000. Oof, finally made it. We, we, as How a whole, <laughs> we made six figures. <laughs> now, take out expenses. We weren't making. We you weren't. Get a share with Austin. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So in 2009, when, when Austin joined me, we, we started taking a monthly salary of $500 a month. My truck payment was 525. <laughs> Thank God for credit cards. Yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Leverage debt right there. Leverage debt. So we were reinvesting that back in the business for future growth. Everything was reinvested. Yes. Okay. Everything that we do up and even up to this day, we reinvest in our business. Okay. So. Pause real quick. So right now, for these few years, we're still a brand new agent. So one of the questions was kind of what do you recommend as first step, second step, third step for a brand new agent? Do you feel like that's kind of been addressed for you as far as what he did to start getting business? Yeah, I think it's great. Okay. But it had to be, I was 24 years old. So my, my core network was still, they were still in school. Right? They weren't making any money. They were, uh, you know, their parents weren't gonna buy or sell through me. They had their own connections and I'm brand new. So are you gonna trust a 24 year old? Now there are people that have trusted me at that time that didn't know me, but you know, with your core network, are they gonna trust a 24 year old to, to sell their biggest asset or most likely their biggest asset? So it, I had to go out there, right? And then, you know, you know, there was you know one of my one of my people I looked up to was Josh Chong, right? Um, you know, he he got in the business at 18 years old. He didn't have a, a network, so there's a lot of that where where I where I rip off and and or implement to my business, you know. And and the whole goal is to figure out what is what is someone doing better than us, and how do we implement it in our business, right? Even even if they do it better, and if I do it 50 do it well enough, even 50 percent. Then my business should increase, and I should have a positive return. Great. And the second thing, from kind of my look at your story, right? You be patient. Your first three months. Second year, fifteen. Right? I mean, like be patient. You need to invest a year to two years sometimes before you yeah. see the fruit. Yeah. Well, I didn't. You know, again, you know, and, and let's back up even further. At seventeen years old, I dropped out of high school and got a GED. Right. My mom has a doctorate in education, so she's a, she's a teacher, a principal, and now runs a, a school district. So that's. Dropping out of school and getting GED is kind of a, like a slap in the face to to an educator. So yeah, we're shameful, right? So it's it's a matter of like I, I want to prove that I'm not going to fail in this. I'm going to go all in. And and taking if I would have taken that asset management job, that that business is no longer right. That was only a short. If you're only in it for taking the short term money, then you're not going to last. And so it's it's having that that patient play and figuring out if we implement, and I'm a very impatient person, but if I know what, I, what I'm doing right now will impact my business 90 to 120 days from now, then, then and, and if it doesn't, then we quickly change it. 
you know, the what's the uh, the rule of insanity? You know, doing the same thing over and over, doing the same thing over again and expecting a different result. If if after six months you're getting no results, maybe it's time to change it up or or tweak what you're doing. And to just look at the trajectory there. I mean, that's 2007, 2008, 2009. Not the most fantastic time to be in the real estate market, and there's still a year over your growth um, on the hump. So. Now if we're in 2010, Austin's in the business with you. At this point, is it still just the partnership? What's the business looking like? So in 2010, uh, it was just Austin and I for a while. Um, for the first for the first six months, um, we still we, we needed to perfect the calling, right? So before you can hire someone, if you're going to have them make calls, you you have to still understand what kind of objections or what kind of challenges you're going to face. So. You know, and also, also with a partnership, you got to figure out how that partnership's going to work. So, even though he's family, you know, there were times that that we had big blowout fights because it seemed like you know he's at home on a weekend while I'm running appointments, and I'm like, look, dude, like something's got to change here. You can't have two chiefs. So ultimately, you know, we we we're we're, we're having to find what our roles. Were. And if you know my brother Austin, he's definitely not a uh, What's the best word? If he's going to run an appointment, he's not, if, people person? He's not the best people person when it comes to trying to get direct. people to, to sign listing agreements or, or you know, being a yes man. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, in 2000, so in 2010, we jumped up from 23 buyers in 2009 to to 39 total transactions in 2010, and this is the first time that we had sellers be our primary source of business. So we represented 24 sellers and 15 buyers, and in 2010, made $200,000 in GCI. So if you go from 2009 to 2010, that's a 66% increase. Um, we did, in, in the middle of 2010, we did hire two people to make calls. Um, our first person worked part-time on the weekends, uh, who still works for us today? He came from the oil and gas industry, um, and and we got a sweetheart deal of it. No one can ever replicate what we pay him, um, so it's not a model that you can build it off of. Um, but it got us learning how to teach someone else to make expired or sell by owner calls, and for them to set appointments. So there's always trial and error when you hire someone else to to you know leverage things off your plate, right? So what what someone else may think of a as an appointment may be crap when you actually go out there and run it, right? So in 2010, you're still facing people that are upside down on their mortgage, who, are who aren't behind, who can afford the house, but just want to sell just to, just to move, but they're not willing to, to pay twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 to get out from underneath it. So it was having to learn how to teach someone and also teach ourselves quali you know, qualifying the lead. So who was the second hire? The second hire was another caller. Uh, she was full time, and that was a that was a bad hire. Um, it wasn't the right hire. She wasn't a caller. Um, it, it, if you look at personality profiles, she fit more of an admin style. Um, but we were a big believer in in bringing revenue in first before hiring an assistant. Even though if you read the Millionaire Real Estate Agent book, it says to hire a, a, a you know a support role first. You know, an assistant, uh, a transaction coordinator, coordinator, etc. Back to the caller, what are the key attributes you look for if you're going to hire a caller? I look for an aggressive personality, so um, if you follow the DISC profile, I look for someone who's a, who's a high I or high D. Um, high I's like to have conversations, high D's like to get to the point and, and will be a little bit more aggressive on, on phone calls, or typically they are, um, when calling expired, you know, expired appointments. So you're looking for your twin, is basically what you're... Yeah, I don't like to talk to people. He's not a high I. I'm not a high I. Okay. I'm, I'm a high D, and, and there's some C in there now for compliance. Fair enough. <laughs> okay, so 2010, it's you, Austin, and one and a half callers? One and a half callers. We did hire uh, Stephanie. Um, Steph, when did you start? Uh, August 2010. August 2010. So Stephanie was our, was our who's now running our operations side. She was our, our first admin hire, right? Um, and, and she was a referral to us by the team leader here in this office. And we couldn't afford her at the time. And, and how our team leader, you know, we always get hung up on salaries, right? If, if you 
if you look at, you know, if I was to hire you, Michael, and you wanted to make, you know, you wanted a salary of fifty thousand dollars, you know, we all we all look at fifty thousand dollars that we have to pay out. But really, if you break it down into the first ninety days, what is what is your my out of pocket? So we look at everyone on a ninety day hire basis. So you know, you know, when we hired Stephanie, we had to figure out one if we could truly afford her. Two is if our business increased because she was taking a lot of that the contract work or the paperwork off our plate and my brother and I are awful at, at paperwork. I am still awful today. Um, I, I have one buyer deal right now that I'm just, it's, it's a mess because of, of, of just how I run things. <laughs> it, it's, it's, it's sloppy. So, but that's what the, that person's supposed to be. So looking for talent, you know, someone mentioned looking for talent um, is, you know, even though I'm not, wasn't big on referral base, you're gonna find your talent within your sphere first. You know, if you're looking on Craigslist or if you're looking on, on a job board, typically those people that are looking are un, unhappy in their current careers, or maybe they have a victim mindset mentality and they're like, you know, they're, they're not taking advantage of their current opportunities at their, at their own work. And they'll probably, a lot of times, may leave you later on and, and badmouth you, just like they were doing at their previous company. So we look, a lot of times for, from within or within our own network for, for talent within hiring. From an agent role, we will, you know, we will, we will call agents um, that are already licensed, we'll go to the new agents, um, we'll go to Craigslist, we'll go everywhere else and, and bring those people on since they're independent contractors. So when did we start growing enough to bring <coughs> agent, other agents in? So in 2011, is really when we started bringing in agents. Um, um, our first buyer's agents was someone that was on a team here. That team wasn't doing very well, and we just were, were in conversations with her, and she, she just happened to come over. So we weren't looking. It was just an opportunity. We were generating a lot of uh, Craigslist leads, and you know that was in 2011. So if we really look at our growth from, from, uh, from 2010 to 2011, um, if we go back, 2010 we did 200,000 in GCI. In 2011 we did 278,000 in GCI for a 39% increase, but we represented 33 sellers and 20 buyers. So we did 53 total transactions in 2011 compared to the 39 in 2010. What was the structure then for you, Austin, and this new agent you brought on? So, as well as the callers and everything. So the structure started lining up that I was a listing specialist. Um, that that's what my role was. So I was calling with with in 2010 we ended up firing the, the full time ISA that we had, the full time expired call. We kept the other gentleman on who's now with who's still with us, Gavin, uh, who was only working weekends. So Monday through Friday was my responsibility for calling expireds myself, as well as setting appointments, running those appointments, and converting. Um, so it, it was becoming to teach myself on how to, to lead generate for, for listing-based businesses. Because if you look at how probably most new agents are in this business, they're heavy on the buy side. And what they, they struggle with trying to, to figure out and how to flip it is how to either get to an even 50-50 business or even be a heavy listing-based business. So in 2011, we made the full commitment really to go in all on the listing side. So uh, I don't really remember how many, how many people I represented out of the 20 buyers in 2011, but I do know that we started pushing a lot over to the one buyer's agent that we had. And then I think at the end of 2011, we brought on our second buyer's agent, um, who if you go off the disc profile, she should have been an agent and, and only lasted about eight months. Okay. And then the model was the specialized model then? It was a specialist model. So our buyers, so our structure was, again, I was a listing agent. Our buyer's agents could only represent buyers. Um, and, and the one reason we had it that way is because that's what everyone else was doing. Um, you know, rip off and, and implement. And two, it's hard to teach someone to go and take and compete on expired listings. That's one of the hardest things to go and teach because that's an aggressive personality type. You're competing typically against seven, eight, nine, ten other agents. You're competing against agents who will who will do it for one percent. They'll do it for two hundred ninety nine dollars. You know, they'll do it for for whatever. And so you have to learn how to differentiate yourself as well as provide that value. Okay. 
So at this point, what's your mindset in the business as far as where you want it to be going, growth, what you currently have? Um, obviously, you kept growing year over year, but... So the mindset was uh, just, again, to make as much money as possible. There was no, I wish we were strategic in thinking like, oh, we're going to, we want to make a million dollars. Uh, 2011, we really started a shift as well. In 2011, 2012, we started to shift how our partnership worked, where my brother ran our the investment company, and I ran the traditional-based business through the Good Home Team. So we started learning who, what our real roles are. So. Um, I was teaching another class and, and they asked about partnerships and I said the number one thing about partnerships is you've got to figure out what your role is going to be and what their role is going to be. And you have to be good with it once those roles are set. Do you think that now you guys had established those roles, do you think it took less time to get to where you wanted to go or were you still now working even more hours in <laughs> that business? Um, I would say both, right? So. You know, we, we, we still have clear, defined roles, but there's still times when, when those roles get muddy. You know, if, if, if the good home team has a bad month, you know, you know, Austin would jump in and be like, why is this not going on? Why is this not happening? You need to do this better. Or if we're not flipping enough houses at the time and generating that income, you know, you know so we, again, it, it, we were learning our roles on that. And then it was also in the traditional based business, it's still, you're still, one, we're in a recession, and we're coming out of it, but we're still having to learn how to, you know, we're still developing our sense of, of style. And how much are you paying yourself at this point? Um, Will you be on 500 a month? I think we upped it to $1,500. So I was, I was in the positive um, for a little bit. <laughs> I just point that out because I think it's kind of an interesting mindset that probably a lot of people don't jump in and think about when you're an agent building a business is treating it like a business and not just a job and I mean that comes down ultimately to what everyone wants but their bigger vision was to build wealth so you know they sacrificed in the short term to build it up in the long term and it's just an interesting mindset to think about that maybe doesn't always get said quite as much yeah so, we weren't going to drain the business account a lot of people I see live they don't even have a business account they they put everything on their personal accounts. They don't know how much they make. They don't know how much they truly pay themselves, right? They just commingle everything, and then this, at the end of the at the end of the month, they're paying their bills. And so, you go and try to separate it, and they don't know if they want to grow their business. They don't know how to pay an assistant. They don't know how to pay their their team, and and it's it's just not going to work. It's going to fall apart. So can I ask a question? Yep. Yeah, go ahead. At that point, so if you are only paying yourself fifteen hundred, your money's going back to the business. What does that look like? Is that salary? Is that leads? So it's both. It's salary. So again, we had Stephanie. I think, I think there was a raise in there. Austin handled the money at the time, so we were paying a little bit more, right? Um, and it was it was testing out new lead generation ideas. I mean, our, our website got nicer. Um, we were running. We were paying for an automated guy uh, a guy posting on Craigslist more. Um, uh, I think we hired Alex in 2012. 11 and 12, so I think it was 12 really is when you came on full time. But we hired Alex and we couldn't, actually 2012, so if we look at our growth from 11 to 12, so 278,000 in 2011 to, to 434 in 2012, so a 56% increase. So everything that we were doing in 11 and implementing lead structure wise and, and focusing on expires and focusing on listing based business, we represented 55 sellers in 2012. Now, what closed underneath my name, buyer-wise, was 16. Now, there were some transactions that closed under some of our other agents that the, the office doesn't go back as far to track, um, which there's a little bit more transactions than just the, the 16 buyer deals. But you can really see, being a listing-based focus, you get really good at being able to pitch that value proposition of why they should hire you. And most of those, I'm gonna, it, and I'll break this down and, and, and po post it in the Facebook group. And a lot of it, I'm going to say about probably 30 plus percent of that is going to be expired listings. Okay. So then Alex comes on 2012. 2012, Alex comes on. Full time. Full time. We, we probably truly couldn't afford Alex at that time either. Um, if you kind of notice what we do is we'll, we'll invest in, in talent. And, you know, Alex's role doesn't have a true death title or definition. So, you know, Alex Alex came from from the UK, has master's degrees and 
things I can't even pronounce, <laughs> and, but he builds systems. And so Austin and I are sales, we're sales minded, we're not system minded. We're all about, let's just figure out how much, how many contracts, how many deals can we bring out, how many flips can we do? We'll figure out the systems later. We'll throw money at it to fix the system if necessary. So Alex started coming in and really tracking. I mean, this, this track, I wouldn't even know my numbers if it wasn't for Alex, to be completely transparent. Uh, you know, and, and out of that, so in 2012, $230,000 <coughs> of commission came from the listing side, 204,000 came from the buyer side. Oh, it's a good split. Yeah. Okay. So then from about 2012 to let's say 2014, 2015, what's, what's the structure, what's the business looking like um, with the team? So the structure, it was a specialist model, right? So we would recruit agents in, there was no value proposition to, to join our team. Um, I called it the redheaded stepchild room, right? So I would bring people on, they wanted leads, I could provide leads and I would throw them in the back room and I wouldn't even learn their names. Um, and whoever whoever lasted, lasted. One of those. Yeah, right? So, I mean, it was a selfish based model and it, it was, you know, all they could do is work buyers. That's all they could do. If they had a listing, they referred, They would send it over to us, I would work it, they would get no referral to me on it. Um, and again, it was selfish based, right? And, and my, the, my mindset at that time, what, we weren't being selfish on purpose, but the mindset at the time was we were so focused on the listing-based business that once we kind of perfected that model, then we could go back and fix our buyer side, right? So that was the mindset. It wasn't done maliciously or on purpose, but you know you can only have your focus go in one direction. You know, if you're going this way, you're never going to to get where you're going. And we're all taught, especially by MREA, that you get listings to last. So they give you more leads, they give you more opportunity to grow your business. Yeah. Uh, on that note, uh, kind of thinking back, what were some what, what are some of the things that you would have done differently? Understanding that you have to have focus, right? But yeah. how would you have what, how would you have treated the maybe maybe differently, or what, what are some of the things that you might have done better in that case? I don't know if I would have changed it, honestly. And and, and because, again, I was so focused on my self-development. Maybe I shouldn't have started the team. <laughs> Maybe that's what I would have done differently. It was just my brother and I focused him on investments and, and me on the listing base. Maybe I would have brought in a showing assistant. Maybe that's how I would have changed it. But it, it's, you know, we get, we get kind of sucked into this team-based model, especially within the Keller Williams world. That's kind of, that was the hot topic at the time. Let's start a team, let's start a team, let's start a team, right? And so we were looking at it and it's like, you know, the, the, the topics at Family Reunion and, and at Mega Camp at the time was don't work any buyers, only focus on listings, refer all your buyers out. So it's like, all right, basically we were just referring our buyers over to them or they were truly glorified ISAs working for free, inside sales agents, working for free and if they close something they would get 50%, right? So I probably wouldn't have changed it other than maybe I wouldn't have started the team as quickly. You know, because you got you gotta develop yourself first. Because if you're not a great converter, how are you going to go teach someone else to do it? So I may be jumping the gun in the, the timeline here, but you mentioned you kind of, for lack of a better term, threw the, the buyer's agents to the wolves and mm -hmm. let them figure it out, right? And yep. they converted, great. At what point did you mentally make the transition from, okay, I focus on listing, I'm, I'm now got this side taken care of, now let me focus some energy on this side, teaching, preparing, and getting them where they need to be? So that came from working seven days a week and starting to get burned out. So I'm um, in the middle of that. I mean, the business calls a divorce. So, you know, and, and, and you know, uh, I'm remarried now. And with that, my wife was like, hey, you can't work all this time. She was, I think actually when the mindset really started, she was pregnant. I think, right, Heather, that's when we shifted to some of our team model. Was when Hashi was, yeah. So it was like, all right, I can't work six, seven days a week and, and you know, and see my kid and see my, my family. So I was actually at a, at a real estate class, Tim Heil's real estate machine, and Elizabeth was there, Austin was there, Alex I think was there, yep. and we started looking at the hybrid model. And the hybrid model is, is the, it's a non, it's a non-specialized model. So basically your agents can work both sellers and buyers. Um, you know, you start focusing on a, a structured environment so we go back to structure. We didn't have a true team structure. No, we claimed, y'all claimed, 
to uh, be in the office, lead generate like 20 hours a week, um, which no one mandated that. Um, there was no time commitment to be in the office by a certain time. There was no script practice, no training on that sense. Once a week, we did accountability meeting if he remembered to show up and not schedule a <laughs> listing appointment. I mean, honestly, otherwise Austin would run it if he was there. Um, and then otherwise, it, it didn't happen always consistently. No. So. No, so, and that's kind of how our, like even that culture will develop naturally. You know, the culture was we would keep trying to implement a structure and the agents that we had at the time was like, oh yeah, this is gonna last two weeks. So no one bought in, right? No one bought in, but you at that time had yet to make that mental shift. So you were still focused on listings and self-development and it wasn't until what? August, September, October, 2016 that we went to the class and the shift yeah. happened. In yeah, so, so we went from, from 12, so 2012 of 434,000, 2013, we had another. We had a 39 percent increase to 604,000. So we broke the half a million dollar mark. And in 2013, we we broke 100 transactions as well. We represented 73 sellers. Um, and then, and then I can't remember how. In my system, it shows 20 plus buyers, but that's just what's closed in my name under MLS. Um, and and it, it was a little bit higher, but we did break 100 transactions in 2013. Um, and then if we fast forward 2014, we had a 45% increase. So we went from 604 to $874,000 in 2014. Represented close to 105 sellers. That also means at that time that we were listing, you know, a lot of properties. So we were, go ahead. How many callers do you have at this point that can call calls all that? Yeah, one, one cold caller. He's still cold calling too. Who else is on the team? So who else is on the team? It's myself still, it's a specialized model. Frazier? Frazier? Nope, not in 2014. So still a specialized model in 2014. Um, and we had Stephanie um, as running everything still on the operations side. We had Alex running our systems and, and you know whatever lead idea I had at the time, lead generation concocted, you know, I'm like, let's do this, let's do this, right? I'm like, I chase all the, the flashy objects. I'm, I'm ADD when it comes to lead generation, you know, but Expires is, is what I'll state in the system too. You know, that's that's my main, everything else is my side piece, right? So that's, <laughs> that's the lead generation that I chase that. But, um, you know, 105 sellers, that means we were we were listing, you know, probably 12 to 13 plus houses a month on average. It's just him and Gavin. Just, and that's just me. That's, again, seven days a week, whenever someone's willing to say yes. And that was Gavin, who was starting to work, almost starting to go full time with us. He was still part time. Um, uh, I think 2015 is when he went to working seven days a week for us. He doesn't like to take days off. Um, and, and, but the focus, again, was so heavily on listings. If you look at our GCI, six out of the $952,000 that we made, or, or $874,000 that we made in 2014, 527000 of that came from listings. 347 came from, from buyer side. So we weren't, again, we weren't focused on, on how to convert buyers at will. Are you using like a dialer or something? Or are you like, just like a phone? No, you didn't have a dialer. Um, we ha Gavin had a dialer. Okay. Gavin used Mojo systems. Okay. So three line dialer. I didn't have the dialer. So, you know, my role was, was Gavin was setting at that time so many appointments in, in, in the expired, like when you're setting that many expired listings, you have a high cancellation rate. Right, so my role was going in and following up with the cancellations as well as following up with the people that I met with and who didn't commit to signing. So if you looked at how my, my follow-up system was, and, and we didn't have a true CRM at that time just yet. We were trying to implement, I think, Salesforce. We were going to Salesforce at some time. Um, but I think, yeah, we were using Wise Agent. Remember that, that system? Yeah, it was a crappy system. Um, um, but I had an accordion file on my desk that, you know, one through 31, and when if you, someone told me to follow up with them on the 14th, I would just go in there, and so it was a seven day a week, you know, follow up system that I had to do. So I was working every day. It's a very manual follow up system. It worked. Okay, so now, that was 2014, 2015 was a good year. 2015 was 
We only had a 14% increase though, if you really look at it from 2014. So we did 874, went to 952,000, closed 105 sellers. I don't have uh, the buyer transactions on this, but um, you know, 603,000 was sellers in commission and 349 was in buyers. So we started in 2015, we started implementing a farm. Um, and we took it from, I believe it was Russell Rhodes. Uh, we took one of his farming classes and there's a, another guy named Kenny Klaus out in Arizona um, who built a huge business off farming. So we started running uh, postcards, we started running a newsletter and we were picking neighborhoods that, that we wanted to work and two met our turnover rate. The turnover rate had to be over 6% turnover rate and it couldn't have a dominant agent um, meaning that that agent had 20% or more of the of the home sales in that neighborhood. So, and we ran that from 2000, you know, really that entire year, and we started to dwindle it off because we started to see a drop off in our in our return. Do you have a farm today? No, we don't have postcards today. So then, in 2015, were you the only one running listings? I was the only one running listings. 2016 was when I really started focusing on. Frazier ran a few, didn't he? Not really. So so I brought we brought we brought another caller in. He was more of a nurturer at the end of 2015. Um, and and he wanted to become an agent. He actually worked uh, at a bank and quit his job based on what I told him. And so he went from making you know fifty thousand dollars to nothing. So we said, look, you know, this is this is a tough industry to go from making a salary to, to making nothing. So we hired him on as a caller. And so in 2015, um, we started, we were, we started, we were pulling back on our farm and we started circle prospecting. So we went more of a prospecting based farm. And circle prospecting is when you cold call neighborhoods, you know, and telling them that a home sold in their neighborhood and you know, on average, when a, when a listing goes up for sale, typically three to five more homes go up on the market within the next 90 days. Do they happen to know someone that is thinking about selling or buying a house? And so the, the, the circle prospectors and, and Josh Frazier, who worked for us at the time, their job was to put in nurtures into our system. And a nurturer was someone who said they were going to sell their home in the next 24 months, which we actually revised to 12. So, you know, we're always tweaking. So the first step was they said yes to selling their home in 24 months. Uh, they were willing to give us a good email address, a good cell phone number, and were they, did they have an agent that they were dedicated to working with? If they said yes to that, we would not put them in our system. If they said no, they did not have a dedicated agent, we would put them into our system, as well as an agreed upon follow-up date to when our nurturers, which was Josh Frazier at the time, could call and start building that rapport. So uh, we went from, from sending out postcards and making these cold calls. Uh, we were not very profitable on that venture in the first year, but in 2016 and in 2017, those have been our top and our top three lead sources. What do you think changed? It's two things. One is we tweaked, you know, we got better with our callers of what they were saying, how they were qualifying, and two, the longer that person sat in our system and getting our emails and getting our, our, our uh, calls and building that rapport, it was, it was time to let it just kind of marinate. But also like November, December 2015 was when we, y'all, not me, started building out the call center and there was five plus callers with us, whether they were brand new, yep. trained, nothing. Um, so then there was also more manpower, more calls being made. Yeah, so the call center we were talking to, and then we would check on a daily and weekly basis how many nurturers they were putting in the system. Uh, a good caller was putting seven plus nurturers in the system. The average was three a day. Did you know this in advance? Did you, in other words, did you get those numbers, your targets, or was it just? This is this is based on based what on we, experience. This is based on our experience. Yes. We had, we had what, at one time we had five, um, and they were, 
hitting four to 500 people, I believe, at a time. So they were making about 3,000, 2,500 to 3,000 phone calls a day. Is that right, Alex? Probably more like than that. that. Gavin alone will do five to seven. He'll do a little yeah. more. So, so we, I used to have those numbers. I mean, so what ended up happening, I got this awesome idea. It's, a, it's an amazing idea. <laughs> that we're gonna fire all of our callers because our agents are gonna make these calls. It was a, the best decision we ever made. <laughs> it wasn't, it wasn't. So we fired, we fired all the callers a year, later. a year later after it was starting to work. Um, and, and we were gonna have the new agents coming on board. So bro, we go back to your team value proposition, right? So in 2016, when we were trying to get people on, on our team, you would come in as a junior agent. And those junior agents would have to make cold calls for the first 90 to 180 days. So really three to six months. And they would have to put in five, nurtures a five day. it was really 500 nurtures they were supposed to hit. Yeah. So in order to get out of the junior agent system of not getting paid, they would have to put 500 nurtures in the system. And what kind of time? Six, six, six months, was six no months. more than six months. No more than six months, otherwise they'd fail out. Okay. Yeah. So once you start doing that as a value proposition, they don't see that as a value, right? You're gonna come in and make calls for free for six months. Well, hopefully. let me say they didn't see it as a value where the business was at the time. It would. It has worked for some. It has worked for some, just not ours. But, <laughs> but you know, it, it. Everything we do, we we we're looking at businesses where, where we want to be. Right, so we try to implement, and then we all have to realize that we all have our own culture. We all have our own mindset of how that's going to work. Right, so if you don't believe it's truly going to work, like honestly, I didn't believe it was going to work. I said it should, based on other proven techniques. But would you come on for six months working for zero dollars and put five? No, I wouldn't either. You know, even if that value proposition, if I go back and look at it, even that value proposition is so over, I should do it. You know, it's just you're everyone's short sighted, right? So. You know, we started rehiring those callers back on, um, and, and slowly doing it because that's a that's a tough running a call center is tough. You meet some interesting people. Um, there's there's one of our mentors and coaches would 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 make a joke with his call center. He's like, when uh you know you knew when uh when uh the constable was coming by because half their callers were gone because they had so many warrants they were getting picked up. So I mean, you you meet some interesting people, but you know, it's a it's a business that can be repeatable, and it can be recession proof, which is all something. If if you were in this if, if you were in this business during the recession, you should be mindful of that because there's something coming. Whether that's two or three years, there's something coming down the road where this amazing real estate market's gonna gonna stop, and we have to be prepared for that. So safe to say, it's a numbers game. Absolutely, everything's a numbers game. So you know. If we go to the to today's model, we're running a hybrid model. So in 2015, October, I believe it was Elizabeth, who graciously made you know the power hour here, um, joined our team. And so we're talking about finding talent. That was all by luck, right? So Elizabeth applied to be one of our callers, I believe. Part time. Part time. So I could grow my own business. So she could steal all of our information. <laughs> <laughs> and and and. I think she realized how hard this business can be building a team, a profitable team at that. Go look at a lot of these teams that are winning awards and they, I can tell you they probably, either they're highly in debt and they probably can't afford, you know, to even be living the lifestyle they're in, right? So, you know, we, we don't do it for the awards, we look at our profitability and our net. So Elizabeth came on, closed one deal in her first six months with us. No. How it many? Like, it was like three. Yeah, I think it was one deal in the first six months. <laughs> but then the last six months after coming and absorbing everything, right? So she's a sponge. And this is what talent will do. They'll push you. They'll annoy you a little bit. And, <laughs> and they're coming in and asking, what, is, what are you doing that's working? And they're going, you know, she would go in and manipulate the callers that were calling, like, hey, if you have a hot prospect, just send it my way. Right? She was learning how to, to game the system. And I think it was, you closed a little under eight million the, yeah. the rest of the year with us. Yeah, so joined in October, um, did one deal then that was really just kind of a handoff thing, and then had one more closing in January. And yeah, we talked about it, got got serious with the business, and really
really in the last seven to eight months of 2016 did 7.7 .7 million. Yeah, and no one else had really pushed us that way, right? So what we started to talk about is, one, we didn't want to lose Elizabeth, and two, because we knew, we knew what she was trying to do, right? You know, yeah, she was trying. Good. She was trying to get all the information and go. She was asking salary information. She was trying to figure out how could she go and replicate this. I told him a month in. We did gold planning in 2015 for 2016, and I told him I was only going to be here a year because I was going to go do what he did and start my own team. So, you know, we went to this. We went to this class and realized one: how are we going to grow this? We had expansion in mind. Um, we, we started to really think of this as a business and how will this start to, to continue to, you know, um, a, a buddy of mine, Denton of Guam, what talks about the hockey stick, right? So you stay this way for a long time. You're doing all this work and you barely see that needle move and then all of a sudden it shoots up like that, right? And so that's what we're, we're in that build, you know, that business growth building mode right now. Uh, and, and we were at this class and we were like, all right, what does this look like in a couple of years? We wanted to have expansions. We wanted to we wanted to be selling over a hundred million dollars in real estate, and it wanted to and it needed to be with me not being the primary producer in this business. We needed to, to be passed along because if we can teach if if us now you and I if we can teach other people to do it at a high level, then that can continue going forward, right? And we wanted to have people in our network because. If we go back to what my brother's doing in the investment world, he, we own over $33 million in real estate today. And that's all because of what this traditional business has, has offered us. So it's, it's a matter of now planning everything out, being more strategic, and, and getting up with the consistency of failure, being used to failure. Our, our February sucked. We had a horrible February. But we can make up for that March, April, May, all the way down. If you're aware of what your numbers are. So, yeah. keep going. Okay, so we made the shift in, in 2016, and then I guess let's talk 2017, then we can get into some of these. So 2017, so so let's go back. 2016 was the first, first year we broke a million dollars in commission. Uh, 2017, we did just a hair under, we were supposed to do hit 1.5, we had some closings get pushed, we did 1.44 million in commissions for 200, at 212 units. Um, we expanded into Houston, um, and what we learned from expansion is expansion will, will frustrate you and will, will mess what you think is you have a perfect model will mess everything up. Yeah, it shows all the holes in all of your systems, and everything, models. If you think you're amazing now, just go and expand and you'll feel like, you'll realize how, yeah, how bad your models are, right? And, it, and it, the goal is to design them. In a, in a replicatable way so that it can run without you. So 2017, we expanded to to, uh, to Houston, um, and Hurricane Harvey messed up our numbers, so I didn't really track numbers that you know for, for 17 down there. But our, our plan for 18 and moving forward is to continue to expand here locally first and, and looking to attract talent, which is one, why we started Power Hour. This is one way to attract talent. So whatever, whoever asked that, of attracting talent and, and team members, you know, teaching classes, teaching your system, showing them that it's actually better. If I were to do it all over again, let's go back to that, I would join a team. Probably not back then, the teams were, were still growing, but if, I, if it were today, I would join a team. I would be a lot more, I would net more money if I was on someone else's team than on my own. And he's not the only team leader I've heard say that before. Other teams in this office have said that. I think it's an interesting perspective. Let's go to what the schedule looks like for our agents. So our schedule, our, we, we implemented a schedule in 2016, which is called the 3-5 or 5-3. So five days a week, Monday through Friday, our agents come in. It used to be at 7.45. We now, get, we now let them come in at 8. Um, so that extra 15 minutes is a big deal. Um, right, Chessman? Um, so uh, they come in. We script practice. And they're, and they're on the phone really from 8 to 11. And they're calling new leads that have come in. They're calling people that we Fizbo's have. Expires. Fizbo's and expires. Or people that we haven't spoken to in our system. So I don't know if you're, maybe everyone else has a higher contact rate, but 
you know, if you're like us, you probably are calling people who registered or reached out and then they never answer their phones, right? You know, and, and so it's all about making sure that we continue to call them and text them and email them until they, they sell or buy a home with us or tell us to, to jump off a bridge. I mean, that's really what we're looking for. So, and that's Monday through Friday. Our agents need to be at 1,500 calls for the week minimum. That's a team standard. That's not always to hit their goals either. So most of our agents need to make 2,500 to 3,000 calls to be hitting their goals every and week. Where are you getting your sources for this? So our lead sources now are Facebook, expired listings still. And where are you getting those, Reddix? Reddix, uh, uh, Vulcan 7 for expired listings. Uh, we're using Mojo for our triple line dialer system. Yeah, we didn't implement that until 2016. And every agent has their own Mojo system. So, you know, that's a, that's an expensive. It's like 100 or 200 mm -hmm. bucks a month per, per agent. Uh, and then we have a lot of sign calls, open houses. So our agents need to be doing two open houses a month. So it's really, you start putting your structure and policy in place, right? And then what we're now tweaking and perfecting is our onboarding process back one step you mentioned about the script practice what value would you put into scripting and objection practice and things like that for successful calls in the future Where, what how much of a value is that to your team and that's for you? the, that should be the if we did nothing else that should be the only value that should be provided in my opinion it shouldn't be about leads it shouldn't be about not even about the system it should be about your scripting the scripting because if you talk to someone and you're stuttering or if you have no energy, no tone, right? So, so like Caitlin, you're coming on. She's she's new on our team within the last 60 days, and her calling has improved tremendously, right? Amazing phone voice already, um, but has a fear a, a fear of calling, right? And we all do. No one, you don't want to get rejected, or you don't want someone talking bad to you on the phone. But at the end of the day, does it really matter? You don't know them, right? The whole goal is thank them and go to the next one. Because what they're doing is now you're just playing the numbers game, and now you, if they're not willing to do business, they've just got you off the phone fast enough to go to the next person to find that, that potential prospect who's going to say yes. We did a, a listing competition with two close teams, friends in 2017, and um, while we were in this competition for a month, we met weekly, and both of these teams outsold us a little bit in 2017, but both of them commented about how much better we were with our scripts, how much better we were with handling objections over the phone. And it was because at that time we were doing it five days a week. Now we've cut it back to three, but I'm um, just to focus more time on more lead generation, but it does absolutely pay off. I mean, those are from people who are still out selling us, who are complimenting us on how good we are on the phones. Um, and how long is that script practice? It used to be 15 minutes. That wasn't enough time because we really role play it out. So it's 30 minutes now. secrets so, I mean, it's, it's all out there right so it depends on who you're calling if it's expired you know you're just you're calling them to find out if they're willing to sell their house again and honestly so I leave the script practice so I'm just gonna answer this one we don't I don't give my agents a hard script to to memorize and to look over we do have tangible scripts for them to use as a guide but when we're scripting every day it's more so understanding the mindset of the lead source and that's the scenario we're gonna role play and then we throw objections out at one another and just kind of get real life play of what you want to, what do you want out of that call? And like he'll always say, you've got two goals. You're either trying to get a follow up like a nurture or you're trying to set the appointment. So ultimately you need to remember that and whatever you need to ask along the way to get you there. So it's more so real life play so they get used to asking questions, digging deeper, finding the motivation so that if you assume you're never gonna get this person on the phone again, are you okay letting them go? Or can you get that appointment? So it's not so much like we can just have these set scripts, but um, here a little bit in the end, in about 15 minutes, think of some of the objections y'all are facing at appointments. Um, 
on the phones, at open houses, whatever it is, and write those objections down because then you can throw whatever objections you're having a hard time overcoming at him, and, and we'll kind of role play that out a little bit of what his advice well, is going to be. And the problem with scripting, or what a lot of people do with <laughs> scripting, right? Everyone thinks the goal is to get an appointment. You know, you're not going to, you know, and the problem is we're not used to trying to also set the nurture follow -up. Right, so if you're throwing so many objections at me that I'm like, one, am I gonna to wanna to call you again? Do I wanna do, really do business with you? That's what I'm gonna determine. And two, if, if your motivation is I'm just testing the market and you're wanting a million dollars and it's worth 500, I'm not gonna change that, right? We have to find motivation. So I'm gonna to try to determine, all right, are you truly worth setting, worthy of an appointment set right now? Or is this something I'm gonna to have to build a relationship with? And, and that's the problem with a lot of these scripting or these people that come in and talk about all this. Is they're like, you need to set the appointment. You set the appointment, set the appointment. It's like, no, you either set an appointment, set a follow-up, or never call them again. You have one, those three options. You know, we're not here to be used car salesmen. We would be all in the, all in the car business. Does starting your calling at 8 a.m. Yeah, we well, should do it. Do it we should actually do it earlier. Yeah, because there's people beating us, right? So there's people beating us to the punch where they're no longer answer their phone. If you go and look at our average pickup rates, our pickup rates are on the decline. So now we're so again, you know, we're not going to change, you know, what what's got us here. But it's you know, small hinges swing big doors, right? So the small minor tweaks, which now we're implementing texting, a lot harder and a lot heavier texting campaign. We're implementing video, you know, we have BombBomb for our video. We're, we're implementing video email services to where we're, we're reaching out to them. So they see that, hey, we're not, we're a real person. Um, and, and, you know, we're just like everyone else. We're just, we're just trying to hopefully earn your business or show enough value to set that appointment. So do you have a thought on what your most successful uh, connection rate is, whether it be via email, text, phone? videos what are you suggesting right now as the number one kind of go-to for reaching out well you need to call them first you can't in my opinion I've never successfully cold emailed or cold texted someone. so once I've built that relationship or or know who they are you know Tessa if I call you you don't know me from anyone and then I'm going to send you a text afterwards that's that's a lot more receptive than if I were just to send a text hey notice your home if I found your number I notice your home no longer is no longer on the market you're just going to ignore that text message typically yeah, I think that's creepy. Yeah, right? So, go ahead. Yeah, so, so the, the cold text I don't see is working. We're testing out, on the investment side, we're testing out doing slide broadcast, which is a, which is a voicemail service that, that you, can, you can send automated, you know, one voicemail out to everyone. Um, but that's from an investment side of deals. I, we'll see how well that works. I don't know how well it would work on our traditional side. So if you guys are making, you got five or eight people or whatever, and you're making 1,500 phone calls a week per person, I mean, there's obviously not 10,000 expires coming on the market every week. I mean, it, it, at some point, you're going to be running out of data fairly quickly, I would expect as far as new. But you're not talking to 10,000 people. That's though. Okay. So we're not talking, that's the thing that we keep, that's the mindset we have to remember, is, is our average, our pickup rates is around 8%. So, I mean, if you're talking to, if you call 10,000 people, you're not, you know, at an 8% pickup rate, you still have plenty more people. That, you still have the same list you can call over again. So you're, you're just recycling and recycling. Absolutely, because a lot of these people, from a, from a circle prospecting, what we'll do is we'll change up our phone number, right? You know, maybe a different phone number will help. If you see the same phone number calling you over and over and over again, you'll start to, you'll, you'll go in your brain not to answer that, or, you know, you know it's a solicitation call or whatever. So now we go in and we change that phone number up um, on expires. We change it up on Circle Prospecting. Within our lead system itself, they've registered on our website. So you know, I never want to hear a complaint that the leads are bad. Because if someone registered on a website and gave me a good email and a good phone number and their name is spelled correctly or all right on there, that's, good. that's a good lead. Because how many times have you signed up online that, and you weren't interested? I mean, I have a fake. I have a, I, could, I probably signed up on a lot of y'all's websites with a fake email that you don't even know about. So I want to see what everyone else is doing. You know, that's if you if someone puts a good phone number, a good email, typically they're going to be interested. And most people don't aren't just out here tire kicking. 
You know, they're looking for someone or there's some type of motivation there. We just have to uncover it. I have a question. Yeah. So I'm going to back you up to the hard days in 2005, 6, 7. Mm -hmm. Up to what? 2005 and six. I mean, I was making hourly, but well, it was good. Okay. It was good for the other broker. 2007 to yeah. maybe when did it turn? Like 2013, 2014. 2008. It, 2008 it turned. Okay, so if you were on your your first year when you did three transactions, up to year 15, mm -hmm. if you were starting today, what do you think those trend? Do you think the, the market would make a difference in those transactions? That Absolutely, was, I think you'd so. You'd be like, oh my gosh, instead of three, I could do 12. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, and if we look at, if you look at some of our growth, we always have to factor in the market growth. The market helped us push along, right? So we always have to be prepared prepared for that. So, you know, again, that's why we live below our means even within our end of our business. I mean, we stopped doing postcards. We, we, we really look at our revenue. We're rehiring even more callers, and we want to make sure that we can afford that because if a market shift, I mean, we, we you know, from a revenue perspective, one, we need to be closing 8.33 million every month to hit 100 million. In February, this right now, we're at 2.2. We're way off. We're down, we're down. We closed 3.3 last year. So if you really look at it, that's we're at $66,000 in commissions for February. Compared to last year, we're almost at 100. I mean, you know, we- Do you we, think that's the market or do you think that's something? I don't, I never blame the market. The market, if you start blaming the market, you, you become a victim. What I'm right? going to blame is uh, our I, activities two, three months ago. Yeah. Well, that was, okay, then what do you think is the difference between last February and this February? So last February we is we made the change and everyone was excited. Right? Everyone you make changes and excited. everyone gets excited. Now it's, it, now it's boring, right? You're coming in every day, That's Monday through Friday, yeah. and we're, we're having to make our calls. And it's working though. I mean, I'll get, I'll call someone out, Brian Chesman, who's on our team, who had a little bit of a mindset that the, that he's not that great on the phone. So on Tuesday, you know, it took him however long to set one appointment, ran it that same night, and signed the guy. So we we start working on on that mindset of all right, make the calls first, then let's figure out how to get your conversion or appointment setting up, and it's usually how your tone comes across. So if I were starting over today, you know, am I am I brand new, not knowing anything? Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot more training at our hands now than ever, <laughs> right? And that's something that even Elizabeth and I talk about is is I feel like a little bit of our, our growth is stagnant at the moment, and we provide so much more training, so much more scripting. I used to throw people in a room and would say, "Hey, you have scripts from Ignite, just read those." You didn't even advise that. Yeah, see, like, so so now we have so much more, and we all have it. it we all have it. You can go to YouTube. There's so many people. Yeah. Can you give us kind of like do a script like about expires or something like? Because um, I, I thought the class was going to be like more about objections and stuff. So I'd love to hear. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, you want us to like role play it? Yeah, I don't want to role play it. But I, <laughs> I mean, here's the here's the number one thing. Here's the number one thing. When you're calling and expired, you have to get through the first three to five seconds. So if you go read any script, they're like, hey, is is Tracy there? Or is this Tracy? No, I don't even say that. You know, I go with, I don't call about your house. Is it still for sale? Right? Is this still on the market? Are you still entertaining offers on that home? Right? I, I'm a high D personality, so I don't, I'm not going to go over a long fluff conversation. I want to know. Yes, we're still interested. And if they give me some objection, like you're the tenth caller, or no, we're no longer interested. Well, tell me why, why aren't you interested? I know it was on the market last week. And, and I'm sure that if you got a full price offer last week, you probably would have taken that. Tell me a little bit more. What changed your mind? Right? So we wanted, the goal is to uncover their, you know, is to knock that wall down, right? We're a detective. So from an objection standpoint, they're going to try to stop you or hang up on you. So as long as they're still on the phone, you can continue asking questions. Do you call them back when they hang up? Absolutely, I do. Did this morning. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. We must have got disconnected. Usually, no, I say, you just hung up on me. Uh, hung up on, uh, usually, usually what I'll say is, is, is uh, it seems like we got disconnected or you hung up on me. I mean, do they still talk to you after that? Or are they, are they a little sometimes, bit Sometimes. Sometimes. If they hung up on you once, they're going to hang up again more than likely. But it, here's, here's the thing. We had someone the other day, we called like four times in a row, and they kept picking up and hanging up on us. 
But they talked to him for a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> if I can get my name out across to them enough times, they're going to remember me eventually, right? So, so, and, and prime example, you know, I'm, I've, our Houston, our Houston database, I'm calling down there for them to show them that the leads are good. There's not bad leads. And we, we had a, a lead in our system for 252 days. No one touched it. And I called, the lady picked up, it was 10.30 in the morning. It was actually bad, if you look at call times, that's a really a bad time to actually call. The lady picked up, uh, talked to her for 30 minutes, told me that she's in a nursing home and she wants to get out of there, right? So she thinks she's getting out, but she's really not. She gave me her son's information, talked to the son, followed up yesterday, set the appointment for, for our agent to call out there Saturday at 8. In Houston? For a listing in Houston. That I don't even know Houston. You know, I don't even know Houston that way. So that's that's the thing. It's you got just got to do it, right? And and the son who didn't know me, you know, had no idea how I built that relationship with his mom. You know, was kind of rude at first, and then got receptive because who cares if they're rude to you? Just talk to them. You know, don't even engage in in, in people being rude. This kind of oh, go ahead. You said you guys have a team standard of a minimum of 1,500 calls a week, correct? Those are calls, that's dials. dials? Yeah, not contacts. Okay. But what, is there a dial or a contact minimum? No, because you, no. can't, you can't control contacts. Okay, just checking. Yeah, so, you know, I'm a big believer in, in the leading indicators are activities. So our, our activities are the calls or door knocking, right? You can't even control people answering the door. So we do we do monitor appointments, but those vary from agent to agent because we let them set their own goals, and then we kind of back out of what that's going to be for them to hit those goals. But it still goes back to dials or door knocking. Of if you need to hit two appointments a day, why did you stop making calls before you did that? So yes. So last year was the first time ever that our referral-based business was first off, number one, second off in the top three. So our, our bread and butter has been expires, right? Um, last year it was referral-based business, um, uh, circle prospecting was number two, and number three was expires. And I look at it, and I look at it a lot from still, we're still a listing-based mindset team. Now that's changing a little bit as we evolve and grow. And we want to get closer to that 50-50 model of listings to buy side. But that's up to Elizabeth runs my our team now. Right? So that's her job. My job is to make sure that our vision still stays in line with where we're headed, which may change at times, right? So, you know, if Houston works out, we may shut down Houston. I don't have an ego on that. And and we're looking at expanding possibly in, in the downtown Dallas area. We're looking at looking at um, uh, Fort Worth and Arlington. There's a lot of opportunity. So our our vision over the next three years is to really be a two and, you know, with, with the goal in the next three to five years is 10 expansions doing over $250 million in, in production. Um, and and that's, let, that's setting a lower goal for our, our expansion team and, and our hub here in Dallas doing over $100 million in production. So, you know, this will be the, the driving force, our Dallas hub. And so, you know, you start casting your vision. So if you're gonna build a team, you're gonna be the vision maker, you're gonna be the, the cold caller, you're gonna be the agent, you're gonna be the staff, the admin, and eventually you'll start leveraging that out. She's the one who asked, how do you keep a, a sphere pipeline from drying up? So maybe you wanna talk about what we've done to grow our sphere and then your, your thought process on that as well. So from that, I mean, that, <laughs> that's difficult for me to talk on because if I changed one thing about our business, I would have. I would have become more of a relationship-based agent rather than just on to the next, on to the next, on to the next. I'm, I'm attracted to the chase. So um, we started implementing client event parties, to, uh, minimum twice a year. So um, our big staple is our pumpkin patch that we do in October. Um, and, and you know, the, we bring out all the families that, that, you know, that RSVP and they have the petting zoo, um, rides and stuff like that. Um, we rented a movie theater last year, had 130 plus people show up. And then we implemented uh, monthly, twice a month we do emails. In fact, if you're friends with me on LinkedIn, Facebook, et cetera, and I have your email address, you probably get my, my monthly, my twice a month video emails. And that goes out to all, all of our database as well. To just stay top of mind, which has helped. I mean, we're getting, we're getting more referrals. Social media helps, right? People want to still, people want to do business with successful people. 
So we post all of our closings on Facebook, and our agents share it. You know, we're, I do, if you go on, on the Good Home Team Facebook page, we, I, uh, we'll put reviews out there that people left about either our team, our agents, our staff, whatever. Um, again, that's all purposeful, so we can really for our sphere. We did last year. Okay. We slowed it down this year. Uh, we generated over over a thousand Facebook leads with verified emails and phone numbers. Mm -hmm. We closed six transactions from those last year. So, do you feel, are you slowing it down this year because you don't feel like it's as good of a turnover? We're slowing it down because we want to perfect it. There's a way to perfect okay. it. So, you know, I'm a, I'm with a coach right now who last year closed 238 uh, transactions from Facebook. So, uh, his name's Joshua Smith. Uh, you can find him on YouTube. On YouTube. He's got a podcast as well. Um, so, so, we've slowed that down. What we're paying money in is, is some Google Click paper advertising. Um, we're, we're still doing a little bit of some Facebook paid marketing through our website company, but we're testing them out because they say they're the best, just like everyone else says. So, we're going we're gonna to see if it works, right? Um, um, but again, our bread and butter right now, if you go look at expires, referrals, some circle prospecting, we're a little bit short this year on that. Um, and, and we'll work on increasing that. We're, we're getting really purposeful again about hitting those people up that are in our system already. And honestly, we've got 36, 37,000 leads in our system. We turned it off today and generated no more nice. leads. The goal is to figure out how do we not generate more leads, but how do we convert higher at the people that we already attracted and paid for? Um, last minute question uh, left before we do any sort of objections that they want to ask to figure out how to overcome was Michael's question of how do you pitch your vendors? Because maybe you don't have a team now, but you do have a team of people who help you do this job. And how do you make sure that when you're working with your clients, you're going to work with the vendors that you have built relationships with? So I think you outgrow your vendors, right? You test people out. I mean, we've had some greats and loan officers. Um, from title, you know, I'm now married into the title business. And so, and I have an amazing best friend who's in the title <laughs> business. I, yes, yes, I got her the job. Let's, let's say that. So, I mean, it's also, also relationship-based. Uh, my sister-in-law works at a title company as well. But from the lender side of things, you know, you want to look at it, who can help you grow and get to that next level. So if you're looking at lenders who, who maybe are struggling in their own business, maybe it's not the best fit because you want to mimic where you want to go with successful people. Well, how we partnered with Michael is um, Michael worked at Bank of America, then went to, uh, to Home Team. That's how I met through you through Heather, uh, my wife, and um, we already had we already had a lender that, that and we're really loyal to our people. So Michael, just because you know he, he was best friends with my wife, doesn't mean that he's going to get our business. Um, what did happen is is there was a a moment where we did test him out when he was at Home Team Mortgage, and there was an agent on our team who would complain about every vendor or lender or whoever we had. She would. That person would find a way to complain. If she won the lotto, she would complain. Um, um, but she raved about him. And at that time, you know, Michael had an opportunity to to build a team within a refi, the refinance world, um, over at um, Nation Star. Nation Star. And so, when the month, when the moment I told him I was going to start sending him business, he told me, "Sorry, I'm taking this opportunity at Nation Star." So I worked on him for two years to get out of that job. Every time I saw you. Every time. And it's like prospecting, right? So, you know, every conversation turned to when are you getting out of that? Because the refinance world slows down, right? So that's, that's a sh you're chasing short-term money. So in order for me to partner with him, I wanted someone who is based, service-based, who is going to take care of our clients. So that's really what it is. I mean, he's amazing. This is not to harp on you, but... Um, that's why we partnered with with Michael and and you know we even had a you know Brent Hicks over at First Choice is an amazing lender who we were using before and then Michael took an opportunity and and we sold him on a vision uh, of of our growth plan within the mortgage world so you know um, this is something that we're 
Austin and I have have some some ownership in with him that we're going to build out, and then we want to offer you know some type of ownership to our team. So we look at from a team perspective, if you're going to build that, we want to have our key wealth determiners who build our business opportunities to buy into businesses that we create, so they can then get a return like we see. I mean, at the end of the day, our investment side of the business will take care of our family forever. So we want our key wealth determiners like Elizabeth, like Michael, um, you know, Stephanie. Stephanie bought her first rental house last year or the year before, you know, and is teaching her, you know, teaching people how we do it. So that's really what you should look for in your vendors, as well as they should help you close and convert more deals. Actually, that should be number one. We're working on it. We're working on it. <laughs> um, okay, let's kind of jump to some scripting or any objections. If you have questions too, this could be a good time. Two that were kind of thrown out earlier were, you know, how to get the seller off the fence and how to ask for business. And you may have had to ask for business. Um, so to get the seller off the fence or get people off the fence is asking them what's stopping them, right? It, you know, if you're if you're on the fence right now, I'm just gonna say, tell me a little bit more. Why are you holding off? You know, what what has you stopping you from? I can't find the perfect house to move to. Perfect. Tell me about that perfect house. Paint that picture for me. It's bigger. Awesome. It's not Okay. And it's moving ready. Moving ready. Perfect. So what you're telling me is that if we found that today, you would want to you would want, probably want to make an offer on it and get your home on the market. Yeah. Awesome. When can when is there a good time to, to meet with you? Because I still want to see your home first. Because you probably can you afford to carry both notes? No. No, you can't. So you probably need to sell first. Yeah, but I, I'm not sure I'm willing to do that. No, I'm willing to do that. Awesome. I have an amazing program. Um, it's it's called the Bridge Loan, and I'd love to sit down and talk with you more about it. And what what it does is it it helps you get into that next house without having to sell your, your home first. Um, and it's it's very little risk, and I'd just love to sit down, one, see your house and talk to you more about that opportunity. Do you have Saturday at 10 available or Sunday at three? Sure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, she was easy. That was great. <laughs> Those are normally easier ones, though. I mean, motivation, if you're truly not motivated, I can't change it. But if you're talented. These are actually people I've already had listing appointments with, and I have no doubt that they'll use me. It's just. Them. Well, then you need to get them out to look at houses. Urgency. Right? Get them out to look at houses because if another agent calls who can now get them to where they need to go, yeah. and they and that's like, oh, you were able to show me what I need to go so you can do both. And that other agent, she was great. She could totally sell my home, but she wasn't finding me what I needed. Yeah. They're going to go with them. Here's the thing. Interest rates are going up. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. We, had, we had a client who was quoted almost 6%. Now, granted, his credit, not the greatest. <laughs> But I haven't seen stuff like that. I mean, rates are hovering four and a half to, to some of them touching five, depending on credit scores. Yeah. So we now need to get them off because they don't they don't understand how much that impacts them, right? Especially if you you know you mentioned oh you know you want that bigger house and, and hopefully cheaper. Yeah. You know, they're not, too they're not too expensive. Yeah. So so it's all again how you paint it and then getting them out to look at houses. Who else is facing some tough objections on the phone or, yeah? Set an appointment. I would probably talk to them more about. Tell me more about this house. You know, how long has that renter been in place? How much are they paying? Right. Tell me more about how much they're paying. Are they on a month-to-month -month lease? If, if I could find someone that would pay that price right now, could and, and they wanted to kick that renter out, could they? Right. So I'm going to go. I'm, I want to get your mindset in selling first, and then I want to figure out how you determine that price. Okay. If you're yeah. just if you're just pulling a number out of the air, yeah. Yeah. one, I probably can't fix that. Yeah. You know, and two, I, I would try to. If I could meet with them in person, I would I would sit down and ask them. I said, "Would you would you buy this house at that number?" Yeah. So so they agree. Like, okay, you know, I, I see your number. I know I ask a bit more, but hey, I'm going to hurry. This market's strong. You know, they give me something. I'm willing to pay for it. Would you agree or disagree that that this is one of the best real estate markets we've ever been in? Uh, yeah. Uh, great. Do you? How much longer do you think it'll last? I don't know, maybe this year. Maybe the next. Couple maybe years. this year, the next couple of years. So so. 
there's predictions that we're already past the best real estate market that we've ever been in. You start looking at some of the indicators, interest rates are going up, that's gonna start stalling out the market, right? Um, you know, there, there have been some decline in home sales. Now, the last couple of reports that home sales are up, but we're not seeing that huge appreciation rate. Are you agree? Would you agree that we're not seeing as big of an appreciation gain as we were the last two years? Oh, you don't know? Great, I would love to show you, you know, a little bit more about that and why you should sell now if you're truly interested in cashing out. Is cashing out the most important thing? What are you gonna do with that money? Retire, great, I, I, I wanna retire right now too, you know? And, and if I can help you retire, you know, and, and sell it at the best market price we can, would you be willing to sit down and talk with me for 30 minutes? Like if, you know, if we had a crystal ball, more than likely that crystal ball would be selling, would be telling us to sell now. You know? Do you invest in any stocks? No, you don't? What about cryptocurrencies? What about cryptocurrencies? No, no, okay. So I forgot. I hear you, but So what happens? What happens if that market drops in 2019, 2020? What happens to that retirement money of yours? Well, hopefully, I will sell that house every year. Hopefully, but what if it doesn't? Let's let's go off. What if it doesn't? Uh, well, I don't know. Why? Maybe you know the price will go Maybe you never retire, right? Maybe you're stuck. Maybe you're just stuck. Like we can sell it now. A dollar today is better than a dollar tomorrow because infl inf uh, uh, inflation is going up. Yeah. Right. I don't have to sell today, right? I mean, on the perfect. Already, perfect. I can try it for summer and see where it goes. Maybe so, someone will come right before summer. Absolutely. What are you doing to market the home? Uh, well, put on Zillow. Is everybody checking Zillow these days? Yeah, everyone. So just one place? You're just on Zillow? Uh, Craigslist, list. You know, all the um, the free sites. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. No, I completely understand. So what you're telling me is that after the summer, would you be interested in talking more about a full service agent to help sell it? Yeah. Okay, yeah. great, great. So I'm gonna set a follow-up. I'm not here to, again, beat people over the door. So my our goal, again, is to set realistic appointments. If you keep going down that path, that's not a true, even when you meet with them in person, he's gonna go, they're gonna go backwards on what they're saying and they're not gonna be realistic in price, more than likely. So I would just ask, when's a good time to follow up? And then, and then I would just beat you down by my follow-up. Right? I'm going to send you emails. I'm going to send you text messages. I'm going to send you, you know, crashing stock market reports. I'm not going to send you the great stock market report, you know, articles. I'm going to send you the bad ones, right? So, yeah. So, so that way we can get that mindset in. Probably now is the best time, or maybe we advise you. Yes, it probably is the best to wait because I own over 150 rental properties. I'm not selling any of mine right now. Yeah, I like the push because that got me nervous for a second. Yeah, yeah. So, so again, it's all in what your motivation. You want to retire, but it doesn't sound like you're ready to retire right now. Well, you could be lying, right? I mean, it could be. It could be, but we. I have to take things at face value. I'm not going to hook you up to a lie detector test. So, you know, and the, and, the, and as long as you're willing to keep talking to me, I'll keep ch chatting with you, and then I'll set a follow-up date. I'm going to send you a quick text message when I'm done. I'm going to send you an email. I'm going to find you on Facebook. I'm going to add you as a friend on Facebook, right? Because then I want you to start seeing everything. Hopefully you accept my friend request. You know, then I'm gonna send you maybe a message on it. And are you manually doing all that? I am, yeah. Okay. As we all should be. Well, no, but I mean, you're actually texting them. Yep. And, and I've seen that add great value, the, the follow-up text message, because we've all been on <laughs> solicitation calls where we just went through this conversation and we don't really remember everything or the person's name or, or what have you. That follow-up text just really reassures who that person was, what they're looking for, and yes, I will be following up with you at a certain time, so expect that. And then follow up when follow up when you say you're gonna follow up. Because mm -hmm. I've missed those deadlines, mm -hmm. and those are usually pretty bad. And now you're a liar. Exactly, and now they can't trust you. I have a question. Yep. So, you know, we all focus on that kind of call. Yeah. You know, we're all like, we'll put the objection at all. Realistically speaking, there's so much out there. I know you said you had 36,000 leads, right? Yeah. What percentage of those smooth sailing versus, I mean, I'm trying to get a, a wrap around of the small percentage that we're really worried about, if that makes sense. Here's the thing, so from a cold, yes, I understand what you're saying. From a cold-based prospecting business like we are, mm -hmm. we face it a lot more. You know, mm -hmm. we're, we're heavy on expires, we're a circle prospecting. Um, Janet, who's on our team, is, is our best converter at the circle prospecting seller leads that we have. And she's amazing at building connection and rapport, right? So hers hers go well versus some of the other ones who, who don't overcome objection. I mean, 
we always face objection. Even if you get a referral, I've got a referral right now. Actually, I got two of them that I'm that I'm having to fight and overcome objection on. One has an agent who his his new his new wife is best friends with, but she sells one house a year, and he doesn't want to use her, but you know he doesn't want to upset his wife. So we all have to, we're all going to face those objections. So at what point do you look at somebody and go, okay, I've spent three times the amount of time I've spent with you. In which point I could have probably converted three other leads. And you. And it depends say, on how you look at it. Depends on depends on how the conversation's going. If you go and look at some of our some of our if you go look at some of my follow up, it's taken me thirty seven times to convert people. Yeah. If you go look at some of my text messages, like it looks like I'm having a one sided conversation. I mean, Actually, we're this is from yes, from yes, from yes, I had one as a referral right now who. Finally, she responded at 7.30 in the morning, responded back to me, right? If you go look, I have two different numbers for her. I have all the different text messages, all from me. No response back. She's never opened my email. Um, and I've talked to her one time on the phone, and, and there, there's been no response back. Then all of a sudden, she texts me back, is ready to go, um, sends, <coughs> I send the listing agreement paperwork to her. She still hasn't signed, and now is ghosting me again. So guess what? I go back into follow-up mode. And, and continue doing it until you sign with me. You'd be surprised how much that, that really works. And it, it's hard to stay in the game, and at some point you kind of make a judgment call, but there are people that we've we've done that for for months who finally, when we get them, they're like, by the way, I got every text, I got every voicemail. I'm like, why couldn't you have told me, like, no, or not right now, or, yeah. you know, if you, you could have told me something, but they're like, we appreciate the follow-up. A lot of what we get is because we appreciate the consistency and how persistent you are. Well, and still respectful like that and emails are not that difficult to set up and, and hit. Yeah, and you can automate it. I don't automate any of my stuff. Um, um, I'm not doing as much prospecting. I'm, my role now is I'm prospecting for talent, um, which is a little bit different. But I still, once a week at minimum, we'll get on and, and make calls through our system and set appointments for people or build follow-up. I still will take one to, to three listings a month just to continue keeping active in that role um, and, and if everything goes well I'll take two listings this month as long as they sign right so you know and that's and I'm having to follow up a lot harder than I have been on some of the others but we're gonna make our money anywhere on follow up if, if you go and look at it the one time meet and close rarely happens you wish it would happen all the time if you go look it's always in the follow up typically after like the 12th contact not the 12th attempt the 12th contact that you start getting some conversions. And I've seen y'all's follow up on some of the emails. Y'all get creative with them. It's not just, hey, this is Nick with the Good Home Team. Are you still looking at buying? Or it's, so. Well, it's creative, and then it's also like some people get offended you can by it. be a little asshole for some time. Well, right? Because some they're have... direct. Oh. Yeah. You registered on our site. Are you, are you interested in buying yes or no? And well, then then yes Austin. or no is all caps. Yes, Austin did write some of yeah, those. Yeah, that's Austin. <laughs> Austin wrote those, but you know, sometimes they get response back. Are like, you okay is a great text or email to send that they respond to. Well, some of them is like, hey, that I'm not a robot. I am a human. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah, right? So so we do that. Or you know, when you're calling people, call them three times a row. Have you ever answered a phone, a phone call that someone's called you back to back to back? I have. So, you know, that which uh, you guys are talking about actually was to my mind, and I'm probably going to apply a couple of those uh, strategies because I do have a buyer that last week, you know, when I called her, the you know, first time I talked to her, she was ready to go, yes, you know, we're, uh, we just need to get free proof. Got him in touch with uh, a lender, uh, managed to talk to them, all they needed to do was submit the paperwork, and all of a sudden they dropped off the patient here. Yeah. Like, go figure. So I've been calling her, and I got a little aggressive. I just wasn't sure if that was too much for me. Mean, here, you guys in front of you, I wasn't enough. Um, Depends, but she's already a client, so you got to. So, <coughs> if they're a client that's making an offer, that's a little different, right? It could, are they a first-time home buyer? Yeah. So they're scared, more than likely, right? I, I kind of figured that much, yeah. maybe. So, yeah. so we go into their mindset. Like some people get overwhelmed and just will, all of a sudden they're gone. It's like they ghost you, but then they'll pop back up and they're ready to go, right? So we've had that happen multiple times where all of a sudden it's like, right, this person's off the board. We've got someone ghosting us right now and they're under contract. <laughs> and yes, and, and it's, it's not even my client, but I'm now involved. We're tag teaming, we're calling, we're texting, we're emailing. Back to back to back. Yeah.
Does your husband know you have three different phone numbers? <laughs> Does your husband know you have three different phone numbers? <laughs> <laughs> So there was a study, and this is when they were doing direct mail, so there was a study that was done, I think it was Harvard that did it, and there were, they, the study went into a neighborhood that had a dominant agent, and they made up a fictitious real estate agent name and company, and sent out over the course of six weeks, I can't remember how many postcards, it's all online, you can find it, and then they did a, a survey call of who, if they were to sell their home, who would they go with? And overwhelmingly, that person, the people were going to choose that fictitious real estate agent because they had seen their name over and over, over again over the past six weeks. So it's it's and that's who popped up. Even though there was someone else who had been the dominant agent sending out information, maybe not as consistent. You know, their signs are still out there. All that matters is you staying on top of them, calling them, texting them. You know, sending video emails, video text messages. You know, finding them on Facebook so they can see see that you're again you're real and your name's out there and post real estate related content. Do you not send mailers because you feel like it's like we're beyond those times or because of the expense of mail? The expense? I go back and forth with direct mail. Really? Got a love hate relationship with it. So right now if you were probably if you ask me next week next week, we've been testing or looking at some farms that we want to hit again. Mm -hmm. um, because the market's turning anyway. Inventory levels are going up. Now, to me, I feel it's the best time to hit those because anybody with a pulse could sell a home over the past two years. So it's gonna get harder and harder and people are gonna drop back off. So now's, my, now's the time to start picking up those opportunities. So if you were gonna go back to direct mailers, with, like, how often would you say? Um, typically every six, so if I'm doing, if I'm hitting a neighborhood, I'm gonna do it every month with a newsletter. Okay. With a postcard, I'd hit them every six to eight weeks. So we're, you know, we're gonna hit them 12 times minimum and then we would drop the postcard. Are you gonna do cold calling to that neighborhood while you're doing mailers? Typically we would, yep, we would. Um, and then maybe maybe now with digital marketing, running you know, uh, farming yeah. Facebook ad. Um, if, if they click on your information, so if you, if you have them, you know, I love phone calls, right? So I like the people that are calling off of our postcard. But if they go, if you create a landing page off of a, let's say you do, you know, 123farm.com and you're sending them to that website and then you can run retargeting ads to them for cheap, there's ways that you can do that. I mean, that's, Alex creates everything for me, so you would have to get, you know, if you're really good at that, then do that. But if not, stick with, stick with a farm and getting them to call you. Because the most motivated people are going to call. Do you delete anyone out of your database? To farming? Do you delete any, no, anybody out of your database? Do you delete yeah, we trash people. The ones that leave bad reviews. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, so yeah, we take people out. Of, okay. And we take them out if um, if necessary. If they were unhappy, if they were clients that we weren't happy working with, and we don't want okay. to just keep wasting time on them. Yeah, which is not honestly not to it's not to toot our own horn, but we don't take a lot of people out. Yeah. You know, um, yeah. even if even if we did an average job, we're still going to keep them in and try to rebuild that and reconnect. Where do you get your like marketing content and your monthly newsletters and your your that, what is that overall planning? So when we were doing newsletters, we would just we would steal other newsletters and look at those. <laughs> um, we would really really the newsletter was designed to make it very simple. We would keep a lot of the content the same. Maybe do a divorce one. Maybe do you know upside down or short sale because it was during that time. Um, whatever that, whatever was going on, we would just do a quick topic and we would put stats in there. That was the only thing we would change. Everything else would look the same. Um, when we were sending out, at one time we were sending out 20,000 postcards, I believe. It was the same looking postcard and we were hitting, a, we used a company that would hit a general area. We weren't really hitting a true farm. We were just hitting just a broad, you know, area in Frisco and McKinney um, and parts of Plano. Any other questions? So in a nutshell, I mean, what back to the value proposition question? When you're pitching the guys on your team or whatever. It's like the reason you should do this instead of venturing out on your own. They're going to net more money. We take on like again, 
if, if I were to shut this down, I'll go join a team and make a lot more money. So, so at the end of the day, they have to come in and see, one, what value, the, the value that we truly provide, we provide admin support, right? So like if you take a listing, you're done with that listing. The admin, the operations department handles everything. They negotiate the contract, they negotiate price reductions, they negotiate repairs. No other team is really doing that at a high level. Um, from, from a marketing standpoint, we're, we can, we're in charge of the marketing so that they, they don't have to pay for it, right? We pay for their mojo, we pay for you know, any leads coming in. The responsibility of our agents is really to really get good at converting and also working their sphere and their network. We still expect our agents to do 20 to 30% of their business should still be from their own personal network. But our agent's gonna focus on lead generation, lead conversion, running appointments, and writing contracts, which is the most important thing an agent can do. Everything else can be leveraged now. And then if you're talent, you have opportunity to grow within our organization. So we have, you know, you can get overrides off of, off the business. You can get, um, you can expand if you wanna move and, and you can expand and, and open up a, a good home team in, you know, Colorado, wherever, right? Um, as we start building out our ancillary revenue sources like the mortgage side, insurance side, we were, you know, and even in a real estate investment side, we're gonna offer opportunities to buy in on that and get returns on that investment. Do you, do you, do all the leads end up funneling to you or if they build something from their outside sphere, do they keep commissions on that or they get all that? Nope, everything shared. I mean, my, my parents bought a house through one of my agents, right? So. The way I look at it is is that you know everything is is, is shared. Now they it's get a, they get more money off their own personal network, but it's not a, it's not a whole heck of a lot more. But at the end of the day, the, the more successful we all are. I mean, Brian, you know, I, I like to pick on Brian a lot. You know, Brian Chessman on our team, he's a referral based agent, and he definitely could leave our team and still do well. But his business, even on his referral side, has picked up. Ultimately, because of the structure and the environment, so there is there is that ripple effect, right? There's that there's that effect that is not truly measurable, or you see that you know it's not, you know we, we kind of forget about. But being in, a, in an environment with a structure and being in a training base and, and always pushing someone harder, you know you're going to see you know them typically rise up or they'll quit, and that's okay. You know we're okay with people quitting. We're okay with turnover rate. Okay, let's wrap it up there because we're like 10 minutes after we we're supposed to end. Uh, thank you guys so much for coming and being a part of this. I hope it was a big value to you for for your business yeah, and, and how to move forward. And thank yeah, you thank you, Nick and Michael, thank for being you. here with us. Yeah, um, another one of these in March.